The need for the NHI is very clear. I mean, we have very bad health outcomes. We've got health outcomes in South Africa that are, that are disturbingly similar to that of kind of the lowest percentiles in, the, in, in, in a global context. Uh, we do have a public system that supposedly caters to the uninsured, but based on the outcomes, there's obviously something wrong. The constraints that are inherent in healthcare outcomes and healthcare delivery architecture are such that you don't fix this in a year or two. It, it is a long-term project and it's an ongoing project. You never actually get to a point where you go, oh, well, we're happy now. During 2008, an uh, internal ANC document was leaked to the media that had in, you know, in mind a five-year plan to institute a national health insurance scheme offering free comprehensive health care, a provider of choice with no co-payments. And uh, as nice as that sounds, uh, you know, it's like legislating away poverty. I don't think you have much chance of, of getting that going in South Africa. Now, the stated intention is to provide better level of cares to, uh, levels of care to the uninsured portion of the SA population. Again, in a way, that's what the public sector was set up for, but obviously the outcomes are not, not as, uh, as wished for. Uh, and South Africa has developed a, a, a very dualistic um, system of healthcare delivery. You have the public sector that caters to you know, odd 40 million people and you have the private sector that caters to about eight and a half million people. And the private sector is entirely funded by private contributions, either through insurance or out-of-pocket expenses. And um, the public sector is, is, is provided for through general taxation. Now, internationally, there's a very strong precedence for, for, for NHI type of delivery systems. Um, but the South African context makes the implementation a lot more difficult and complex. There isn't a strong economic case against the principle of a national health system because healthcare is a very, very complex market and it's got infinite demand. The more healthcare you provide, the more healthcare is absorbed. So you can't, you, you never meet demand. There's no supply demand um, equilibrium that ever emerges because you know, the demand just increases. And regulatory interventions are often required. It's a public good. Um, now, the South African case, we have a very small tax base. Just out of interest, we've done a lot of country research in the rest of the world. There isn't another country with as small a tax base relative to population as South Africa that has anything approaching a comprehensive national health uh, system in place. Uh, the private sector is well capitalized. It's organized. Um, it's very capital intensive, obviously. Building and running a hospital is not cheap. Now, the spending in South Africa, the private contributions make up about 90 billion a year. The public sector makes up about 110 billion. So we're talking about about 200 billion or 50-50 split roughly. And uh, when you think about it intuitively, it is wrong. You know, 40 million people being cared for with 110 billion, 8 million people being cared for with uh, 90 billion. So it does sound as if something needs to be done there. What we found in our research uh, is that up to 40% of the uninsured people in South Africa, when they need to, be, to go see a general practitioner, up to 40% of the uninsured people go to the private sector as well, and they simply pay out-of-pocket expen expenses on that. Uh, health costs have soared. I mean, the, 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 the increases in health costs are way above inflation pretty much in any jurisdiction in the world. So it has created this, this arena where some intervention needs to be made, but no country has gotten it right yet. Pretty much everywhere in the world, what we're going through here is an issue, and it's on every agenda at every election. Um, the public sector has announced phased in improvements to what they're trying to achieve, but because of the very long lead times inherent to this, I mean, building a new hospital is probably a five to a seven year project and we're going to need substantial uh, capital investment uh, in the public sector or in, in, in the health sector if we want to roll out a national health insurance scheme that, that offers quality care to our people. Now, sustainability on this is a major issue for us because we're not, as I said, this isn't a once-off capital expense. It's an ongoing expense that gets worse every year and we have a very limited tax base and we have elevated debt levels. Sure, they're not remotely the same as, as as some of our trading partners, specifically in the developed world, but in the South African context, they are going to increase in the next five or six years, which means that the, the fiscal space for large increases in, in public sector spending into healthcare, or into anything for that matter, is limited. The data requirements in South Africa, when we tried to model it, we sent one of our staff members to UCLA to, to get training in advanced health modeling to try and get an idea of what the uptake and demand will be once, once you 
kind of open the floodgates here. And one of the most important things you need is, apart from real data down to sub-district level, almost a municipal ward level, because you're going to need, need to know who lives where, what ages they are, what their disease profile is, and what has changed from five years ago. Otherwise, you can't budget for this. And um, in South Africa, we don't actually know what our disease profile is. We have a quadruple burden of disease stemming from HIV and AIDS and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but even on that, we don't make the diagnosis required to actually understand exactly what people are dying from. And because of that, any form of implementation of a system, the more successful the system will become, the higher the disease incidence will be, because you'll be discovering it earlier. So people won't be dying from multiple organ failure. Um, they will be dying from heart failure induced by diabetes, which has a very different cost structure to dying from multiple organ failure leading from pancreatic cancer with metastases. Do you understand the, the concept? And, and the larger the system becomes, the earlier you detect these things, and we're not doing that. We don't have an up-to-date cancer registry in this country. We do not know what our disease profile is in any specific region. We have done a couple of spot studies, but you cannot try and implement a system like this on once-off data uh, if you don't have the exact data on that, and we don't. So then my last point, and this is just a, it's an aside, is just the practicality of implementing a system like this. I mean, initially it was five years, now it's 14 years. A country like South Korea and Japan with all their infrastructure and their very high levels of development and edu general education levels in their populations took over three decades to implement the system during periods of almost full employment. South Africa, we're going to try and do this in 14 years, so less than half the time of, of, of the Japanese or the South Koreans. And um, we're talking about a system that is going to have 51 million users making use of the system three, four, five, six times a month each. And we're going to have tens of thousands of suppliers accredited into this one big Mukulu system. And we need to integrate that and we need to keep it up to date, up to the minute, so that you know where the money's being spent, you need to know how to budget that. Just think back to when we tried to implement Innatus. 500 municipalities, three or four transactions per vehicle per year maximum. It was a nightmare. Okay, it's sorted out now. This is going to cause tremendous strains on, on the capacity because we're you know, integrating Santon Clinic, and Baraguanath is not the issue, or Chris Harney. Um, but think about the local clinic in Limpopo that doesn't necessarily even have a computer. So you need to get lines to it, you need to get fiber optics to it, you need to integrate that system, you need to train the operators, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Just think about the scale of what we're trying to achieve here, and then think about 14 years and you know, tell me if you think we can do it. And it's not that I'm negative on this, I'm just saying that this is a very, very big project and we need to take our time to do it properly. Now, cost in comparisons, very, very important subject, obviously, and they vary quite dramatically. Um, our best estimate and at the moment, it is nothing more than an estimate because we don't know what the details will be. We don't know really whether it will be comprehensive in the sense of minimum prescribed benefits or whether it will be fully comprehensive, i.e. everything except for cosmetic surgery, etc., etc. So we assumed that some rationing will have to take place. So you will have a limit, just like you do in your medical aid. And our best estimate was the Conex base after rationing. So it's third from the left at $244 billion annually. Now, we also did a couple of, of, of you know, Excel exercises, and if we use the lowest form of medical aid contribution, it's a key care program, and we just expanded it to the entire population, it's 202 billion. If we gave comprehensive care, so the top, you know, the top components of, of a medical aid, you will be looking at almost half a trillion rand annually. Using the latest ANC working group estimates, just to have something to talk about, which everybody agrees with, um, well, not a disagree, we don't want to disagree with, they, they estimate that in real rands, 2010 rands, uh, it will cost 376 billion by 2025 when fully implemented. Now, you discount that back, I used a fairly optimistic annualized GDP growth rate of 4%. You get to a discounted final real number for this year of 217 billion. So, again, it, 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 it equates well with with the sums we've made, and 
please note that this does not take into account an increased disease profile. This takes into account the disease profile that we currently think we have. Um, and I can guarantee you once the system is implemented, the disease profile will change and will be upwards. So the shortfall, whether it happens now, whether it happens in 10 years' time, or in 15 years' time, is roughly 100 billion a year, uh, which is roughly twice what South Africa spent on the World Cup every year, and it increases at above inflation. Public health spend as a percentage of GDP will rise from around 4% now to around 8.5% by 2025, even assuming a 4% annualized growth rate, which is, I think, fairly optimistic to think that we can maintain that for that entire period. So some ways have been mentioned by the ANC, and, and I must stress that at the moment this is more an ANC policy and a Department of Health intention than it is actual government policy. I know the Minister of Finance uh, in, the, in the latest budget review did mention the eventual uh, implementation of the NHR, but we don't have government um, numbers yet on when exactly what will happen, so we co it's difficult to cost it. But some of the options mentioned were an increase in VAT, the, remo the removal of the uh, tax expenditure subsidy for medical aid, private sector medical aid contributions, and a mandatory payroll tax ranging from 1% uh, for the lowest earners and 7% for the highest income earners, which will be an NHI contribution. So we worked out, we assumed a 2.5% increase in VAT. I still want to see this being implemented given the, the body politic in South Africa. Uh, that brings about 27 billion. Uh, the removal of the TES is roughly 10 billion, according to, to Treasury. Uh, the mandatory payroll tax will bring in another 25 billion. So we're still 40 billion short. Where's that money going to come from? So if we assume no fiscal substitution, then government share of GDP will have to increase to almost 60% by 2025 to allow for, for, for this increased spending. So just it's, it's kind of a, a red flag that this is unlikely to happen. The initial affordability, next year they've allocated another 10 billion. That's not really the question. But once you start down this road, you can't really get out of it again. Uh, globally, you cannot withdraw from offering health services on a public, on a, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a large public scale. Now, the implications of substituting that 90 billion that I was mentioning um, for private or for public sector funding through taxation is a, it's not as easy as it seems because people change their spending behaviours when taxes are changed. Um, but the macro implications to the economy are not necessarily as dire as the implications for the people that are currently covered by the, by the private sector. Because remember, you will be making this contribution, which at the moment, with the exception of the admin costs that go to the medical aid, etc., etc., if you spend 5,000 rands a month on your medical uh, aid or your medical insurance, you're expecting pretty much at least 5,000 rands a, a month's worth of value out of it coming you know, over time. However, we've got five and a half million taxpayers. They're not going to be contributing uh, the taxes that I mentioned in the previous slide, but that's not going to be spread over 50 million people. So it's going to be buying you one-tenth of the services that it previously bought, which means that due to the fact that insurance is a grudge purchase, nobody likes buying health insurance because you lose the money if you don't use it, um, but it won't be buying the same amount of cover no matter what they tell you, because outcomes in the, in the public sector are not the same at the moment as in the private sector, but it will be diluted as well. So you're going to have to take top-up insurance. Because a lot of people won't be able to afford top-up insurance, I mean, as I say, you, you spend as much as you can, um, a lot of people will fall out of the system. So the amount of money available for the fixed costs of the private sector will be reduced rather substantially, but again, we can't really model that until we don't know the specifics of, of the case, which means that you won't be necessarily paying double your current contributions. You might be paying three or four times for the same amount of cover as you had. Forget about the money. Let's assume we can find the money and we start implementing it tomorrow. Do we have the, do we have the people to roll this out? I mean, healthcare is fundamentally about doctors and nurses when it really gets down to it, and pharmacists and physios and dentists and things like that. Um, it takes years, decades even, to increase your output of doctors and specialists. Because remember, it's not just a question of training a new one. You have to train the lecturer first. You have to build the tertiary in the academic hospital to train him. That all costs money and it takes 7, 10, 12 years. 
we haven't had an increase in output in our, from, from our HR components in the last 20 years. We're still producing the same amount of doctors as we were 20 years ago. The aging of the workforce, specifically amongst professional and registered nurses, i.e. the best trained um, nurses, and in specifically specialists, is really concerning because there's going to be an increased amount of retirement starting now. It's already started. Half of 53% of professional nurses over, in South Africa are over 50. Half of them. I, the, when they start going, we need to start upping the, upping the game. Fortunately, on that, on, the, on that note, I can say that the last two years has seen a, 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 a turnaround in the amount of, of professional nurses being produced. We're not seeing the same in doctors. Now, the case of doctors in South Africa, are, it's not an exact way of doing it, but just as, a, as an example, if you look at doctors per 100,000 people in the population, the high-income countries, so the developed world, 280 doctors per 100,000. The middle-income countries, 180. Low-income countries, 50. Now, we're not a low-income country, yet we have only 55. Even in the private sector in South Africa, our ratio is less than the middle-income countries. It's sitting at about 130 doctors per 100,000 population. So notwithstanding opening up this bottle um, and letting the genie out, even if we just want to get to a position where we have enough people to provide decent health care to, you know, to our populace, notwithstanding the delivery architecture, we need to substantially increase those numbers. Um, vacancies in the public sector, dramatic. It's 50 percent, pretty much across the board. It varies tremendously between regions as well. Um, so you have a province like Limpopo having incredible vacancies. Yesterday on the news I heard that we only have five pediatric surgeons in duty in the, in, in the South African public service. Five pediatric surgeons. So, you know, it's not for want of trying. It's, those people simply aren't there. And you need to address that first before you start playing around with everything else. The age profile, I've mentioned that quickly. Um, this is specialists in the private sector. I got this data from MediClinic and Netcare. 44.6% um, above 50 years of age. In the public sector, um, remember the, the very high volume under 30 uh, is distorted because everybody that is still completing their three years of mandatory service um, after their academic training is captured. So the attrition after that is, is, is very high. But you can see also 40% of the specialists um, over, 15, uh, over 50. And GPs over 50 in the public sector, almost non-existent. There just aren't that many. Uh, so they've all either immigrated or they've migrated to the private sector. We've got in total 27,500 doctors in South Africa. According to the official data, we've got about 35 or 36,000 uh, doctors registered. The problem is that people that train and leave or retire maintain their registration because A, it's not particularly expensive and there's an emotional link to doing that. So even if you're 90 years old, you still pay your annual subs because you're still a doctor. It means you can still write a script. If you have left and you went to work for the, in the UK or in Saudi Arabia 15 years ago, South Africans have an emotional attachment to this country, and I know this from personal experience. My wife's a specialist, and everybody that trained with her, um, all her, her circle of friends, she's the last one left in the country. Um, but they're all still on the registry. So we stripped all that out, and we came to 27,000. We have 17,000 GPs. 9,500 specialists. We're only training 1,400 new general practitioners a year and around 820 new specialists. But remember, this is not in addition to the GPs. To become a specialist, you need to be a GP first. So we're only, the net accrual is only 580. Let's call it 600 new doctors being added to the stock at the bottom before you start allowing for immigration and retirement at the top. So we created a whole scenario around that. Um, the most or the, the least pessimistic estimate we could find for immigration is about 25% of South African trained doctors immigrate. This is not a South African phenomenon. Um, this is a global phenomenon. You have it in the UK, you have it in Canada, you have it everywhere. Doctors migrate. They're an easily relocatable resource. Many will students start retiring, takes 10 years on average to train a specialist. Remember, we still need to assume that there's a person to train the specialist and the GP, and we don't have enough to begin with. So, we created a scenario to get South Africa up to a level where we have half as many doctors on average as a middle-income country. 
and it requires a doubling of GPs and a 50% increase in specialists by, 20, you know, by 2020. So we're, we're talking about 4,500 specialists, 18,500 new GPs, and just have a look there. That's effectively doubling what we have at the moment. Um, so this requires a truly massive increase in output with everything that goes with that. Money, infrastructure, political commitment, better schooling to get people to a level where they can actually go and study medicine. Um, alternatively, massive importation. As other countries steal South African doctors, we can steal doctors from other countries as well. And uh, if we want to steal world-trained doctors, we can steal from India, for instance. They, they, they produce a lot of doctors. But how's that going to look um, with our new partners at, 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 in, in the BRICS countries? Um, and this will only clear the backlog. So this will only give us the supply of stock to actually start looking at how to increase our, our health outcomes in the country. And that does not even allow for the, for the possible 70% plus increases in utilization levels that will happen under an NHI type system, which is not the case in the average middle income country. Um, so in short, and very unfortunately, this leads us to believe that we're not ready to start delivering on this ideal just yet. It doesn't mean we, haven't, we shouldn't start in the process, but I think we need to, to backtrack a little bit on promising this. Donate now and give 15 rand a month. SMS JOIN to 41486.